ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the Enhancing Care Through Music and Memory webinar. Your host for today is Kathleen Lavich. You may now begin. Thank you. Good afternoon and welcome to today's webinar presented by Lake Superior Quality Innovation Network. The Lake Superior QIN is comprised of three organizations, Ampro in Michigan, Metastar in Wisconsin, and Stratus Health in Minnesota to support the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services priorities for health care quality improvement in each organization's respective state. I would like to introduce you to today's speaker, Dan Cohen, who is the founder and executive director of Music and Memory, which promotes the use of digital music players with individualized playlists to improve the quality of life for elders, regardless of their cognition or physical status. He received his MSW from Adelphi University. Dan has spent most of his career helping individuals and organizations better leverage technology. Music and Memory operates in 5,000 long-term care homes and a variety of other health care settings across the United States and abroad. Dan? Great, Kathleen. Thank you so much. Hi, everybody. Glad to be here. Um, I am going to uh, start off um, talking a little bit about music and memory from sort of a 30,000-foot level. Um, all we're doing is really taking what you've already had in your nursing homes, um, music. Music has existed, uh, live music, uh, group music, karaoke, uh, individuals sometimes have their own. Um, uh, but music, as Dr. Alpower has said, typically in nursing home environments, the, the music is um, um, – played, you know, sort of a loop of the 50 top, you know, sort of uh, 40s songs uh, or big band and Frank Sinatra. Uh, and um, and that just becomes background uh, noise to people. Uh, and so what we've done is just taken what the rest of us have had for years and the ability to um, uh, listen only to the music we want to, um, only the songs we want to, when we want to, for as long as we want to, and we're just transferring that and making that available to all the folks in our care. Um, and that's kind of a sea change of a difference. Uh, we're um, amping up uh, sort of that power. If, if for all of us uh, who might um, um, – if, if somebody were to create a playlist for you or for me, um, even if they knew your favorite genre of music, the odds are it's not going to be really successful. Um, and so we're really just um, giving people in our, in our care that same level of control um, and uh, empowerment uh, to be able to carve out a time of day when they're doing exactly what they want to do um, just for themselves. It's not a group activity. It's, it's for themselves, which is a little unusual in a long-term care setting. Um, so uh, – that's what sets it apart. It's the idea we're not paying um, music of a certain genre. We're not saying, oh, this person likes Broadway or Spanish music or, or hymns or, or jazz or classical. Uh, we're taking that information and we're, we're, we're narrowing it down. People will get a benefit from uh, listening to, if you put headphones on someone and you give them sort of nice music of the genre they like, yes, that's going to be an improvement over nothing, um, but it just kind of gives you that 10 or 20% uh, boost, and what we're missing out on is that 100% um, um, benefit of people really being connected with music that is um, not just their favorites, but often music that correlates with um, um, personal meaning, um, music that relates to experiences in someone's life when they were young, uh, people that bring back, music that brings back memories. And that's sort of the power of this, uh, sort of the first stage of the benefit. The second stage is that when people have their own music, they tend to not only feel better, uh, but they're more communicative and more social. And so, therefore, it sparks engagement, it sparks interaction, uh, it sparks more of a social nature, um, bringing back their social nature or enhancing their current social nature. And, and so that you know, we know happiness is equated with um, having three, four, five really good friends or relationships. And uh, when people are in long-term care, that's a more difficult challenge. Half the time, people never, ever get – half the nursing home residents never, ever get visited uh, by anyone. 
Um, and so it's, it's, uh, the opportunity for that is, uh, uh, up to connection with staff, connection with, um, visitors or volunteers, uh, and with family. It'll ha- enhance their, uh, experience. So, um, so that's what's unique here. It, it's simply improving life, uh, and, and, uh, taking advantage in a way of sort of a quick eye heels, heels moment, uh, with the music, uh, to get more out of it. Um, and so to, um, whom is this important and why? Uh, you know, when I started this as a volunteer, yes, I'm an MSW, but I actually have a career in technology company. Um, and on the radio in 2006, I heard a journalist talking about how iPods were ubiquitous and they're everywhere. And I thought, well, you know, that may be true for young people, a lot of us adults, um, but it certainly did not ring true, you know, in any kind of health setting uh, or, or long-term care residence. Um, and so I Googled iPods in nursing homes, and I couldn't find any of the 16,000 nursing homes using these for their residents. And so uh, that's how I kind of got started on bringing this to people. And I, and I thought at first, well, this is really um, – well, day one, I didn't even know it would be good for people with dementia, actually. Uh, and in the nursing home I went to, and I really was not part of the nursing home system. I was not any kind of especially familiar person with dementia. Um, uh, in any way, and so they wouldn't even connect me with people with dementia. Uh, but it still was a big hit for uh, individuals who had some, um, you know, um, cognitive or, or physical limitations. And in time, people said, you really should try this for people with dementia. And music therapists, music therapy, uh, music therapists for decades have known this works, right? But it just never scales, and there are 7,000 music therapists in the U.S., and that's great, except, you know, they would say on their website, you know, we, we can't reach more than 1% of the population, so what can we do to break this out and make it available to everybody? Uh, and so then, yes, I did learn uh, from a number of um, neuroscientists and other folks, yes, this is uh, absolutely something good for folks with uh, dementia, the research is there, uh, the anecdotal experience is there. Um, and people have been doing this direct care have their own stories of music and how it affected different uh, residents, uh, but that was more of sort of a one-off or anecdotal over time. It was not systematized so everybody could benefit. So, yes, it's, you know, because so many people are uh, have cognitive impairment in nursing homes. We talk about this a lot in, you know, music and dementia, uh, but it really is good for just about everybody, um, you know, people with Parkinson's, it helps with fluidity of movement, um, people in pain, so the research has been around a long time in nursing publications, yes, you can uh, use music uh, to reduce the perception of pain uh, by a certain amount, so we see that happening, so music can be built into pain management strategies, um, and music can be built, you know, for people who are depressed. In Ohio, which has run and rolled out more than 500 nursing homes, um, they did their own, every two years they do their own um, uh, patient and family satisfaction survey, um, and they actually prioritized when they gave, when they supported music and memory um, across the state's uh, skilled facilities, uh, the priorities were uh, facilities with either high antipsychotic uh, use, high uh, falls rate, and high uh, depression diagnoses. Um, and so as part of this um, sort of research they did, they, they first of all, they found that the, yes, there were improvements, it certainly received very significant improvements in terms of falls reduction. The music actually helps with falls reduction noticeably, and there's research around that. And, yes, it definitely helps with reducing antipsychotic meds use, and there's research around that. Uh, but it was also helpful reducing, surprisingly, to, to a surprising degree, reducing uh, depression. Um, and um, so that's in their numbers from the state of Ohio, and it's on their website, as well. So, you know, an anxiety reduction, anxiety is pretty rampant uh, in long-term care, and that has all sorts of ramifications, uh, and so, you know, if you want to relax someone, give them their music. Um, so, the um, other big surprise uh, in uh, Wisconsin, where there are well over 400 nursing homes and other facilities running uh, music and memory in the state has been, the DHS has been uh, a big advocate. They've done more than a dozen music and memory rollouts, different funded projects for all different populations and such. Uh, but when I went back to the uh, Rocky Knoll uh, nursing home, the first uh, nursing home in the state to have music and memory, when World News Tonight went in, they did a whole piece. And I said to the administrator, I said, so tell me what feedback you have, what's not working, you know, what can we do better? 
to this dance, you talk a lot about dementia, 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 and the music, but I have a whole community of folks with a variety of uh, psychiatric diagnoses, and this has been just as effective with them as it has been for my residents with advanced dementia. So kind of huge, we're finding. So now uh, Music and Memory is running in New York City. The whole hospital, public hospital system is running it in their inpatient psych. Uh, we have a number of behavioral health uh, initiatives running in all sorts of different facilities in the VA and state facilities um, and uh, psychiatric facilities uh, around the country. And so that's really um, bodes well for within the nursing home environment as well. Um, so just, you know, to whom it's important and why you can just change someone's day. When you change their day for the better, you change your day, staff day. Um, the one thing you can count on when people do have their own music, and of course the tough part sometimes is finding their own music. We have ways to sort of facilitate that process. Uh, but if you can, you're going to drastically reduce resistance to care. If people are enjoying themselves, they're not going to say, no bath, no, I'm not going, no wound care, leave me alone. Um, no, they're going to be like, oh, okay, you know, sure. They're just more relaxed and they're more willing and they're distracted and they're engaged. Um, and so we see that as a big thing so that, you know, it, it, and we know this in so many ways, but the biggest way for me is people always used to say, Dan, you can't, um, you know, this is, you know, it's not going to be uh, uh, for staff. Staff has no time. Uh, well, in fact, when people are um, um, uh, less resistant to care, everything runs more smoothly. Every, the staff time is more efficiently spent. Um, they can get done what they need to get done, and that's why I never hear that concern about staff time. Oh, it's too much staff time. I actually have never heard that after a program is fully up and running. So, you know, these are the kinds of things, you know, sort of why it's important for the residents uh, for staff, for management, uh, for families. Uh, there are just wins all the way around. Um, and what can you do to help? You know, we'll, we'll sort of run through the whys. I mean, you know, take the lead on this um, and make it happen. There are no downsides. It is working. Nobody doubts that it works. doesn't mean every person is going to work for every person. Um, some people it will not work because we can't figure out what music has, has personal meaning for them. You know, just can't play anything. Uh, and then we, we won't reach them, especially those with advanced dementia, those near death, um, and, and others. Um, there was a piece on NPR Evening News uh, recently um, that in California, one of the nursing homes, and one of the residents gunshot wound uh, in a coma, uh, sitting with his mother, um, and she says, she, and he's listening to his music. He's not moving. You know, and she says, no, says, I can see him responding to the music. He's, you know, and in that piece, the neuroscientist who's commenting said, in America, we misdiagnose um, um, levels of consciousness uh, doctors misdiagnose 40 to 50 percent of the time, and uh, so, and here the mom saying, "Yeah, look at this." And so, and we know from people who've come out of a coma, very often they'll say the thing that they remember uh, when they were under, still so, uh, in a comatose state, was the music. And the music that when they heard it, their music helped them step out. Um, and so, with all the levels of consciousness, and doctors tell me that, well, all I learned in medical school about consciousness was either somebody is or they aren't. And so for all of you who have one or more individuals in your care who are um, in some sort of vegetative state, it's a wide-open opportunity because, you know, all these folks get when they come is they get whatever, seven or eight weeks of rehab, whatever it is, and then that's it, right? So maybe we can step them up, uh, and it's kind of wide open um, because nobody else is doing it. Um, so you can take the lead on, on uh, championing and making, getting everybody on board. And the key for success we're finding in these thousands of places that the ones that are most successful are the ones that have total management buy-in. Everybody on the leadership team, not some, not a few who are, you know, jumping up and down around this. But no, everybody gets it and they understand it and they, they uh, are enthusiastic about what's going to happen. Um, and so that's a key. Uh, and then the second piece is to build an interdisciplinary team to roll it out. You don't just say, uh, or the administrator doesn't just say, this is a great program, I believe in it. The activities director, you do it. No, that is a recipe for strictly um, a, a limited, never scale, likely to drop off program. Nothing to do with uh, activities or, or TR director's competence. No, they're great. 
but they don't have the bandwidth. They're not there at 2 in the morning when somebody's up and around. This is a nursing intervention. It's not a program for an hour, you know, a week kind of thing. So this is an all-in uh, program. So let's um, go to a quick video. Now, some of you have seen this. Some of you have not, uh, but we'll give it a run. This is the most viewed video on dementia globally at 62 million views. Um, okay. If we can start this. Click to play. Kathleen, so it's not going for me. Okay, can you click the link below? Right there. Yep, I, I am. Right there. Hi, it's Jennifer from WebEx. Uh, you'll need to share your screen. The links are no longer active once they're loaded to the WebEx. Okay, and how might I do that? On the top of your screen, do you see where it says File, Edit, Share? Yes, of course. Click on Share and then select My yep. Screen. Got it. Okay, so I'm sharing my screen, but I lost my video. Let me find where it is here. Uh, um, well, how do I get it back on my screen? I don't see it. Can you run it? Can you uh, take over, Kathleen? Um, I don't know where it went. Uh, is the operator there, please? Once you share your screen, it will show whatever you have on your desktop. You'll need to pull up the well, slides as separately. Soon as, you as, need to pull up that link. As I uh, – okay, so I'll find it myself. I mean, I'll get it from another site here. I'll get it from my website. Okay, we'll get there. Page, what's the name? Okay, we'll get this. Can you hear it? No. Okay. Okay, so. How are you doing? Can you make a full screen? Full screen, sure. Okay, it's Charlie. How long have you been in the nurse at all? No, I don't. Ten years. You've had a seizure. My mother took and had to come home. Most of the stuff was the truth. You were going, you know, fun loving, singing, you know, every occasion. You would come out with your song, no matter where you were. I remember as a child, he used to walk us down the street, me and my brother, and he'd stop and just sing it in the rain. He would have us jumping and swinging around poles. He was, you know, he was good. He was always into music, you know. He always loved singing, dancing. His name is Henry Drea. Uh-huh. And looking more or less for a religious music for him. Because he enjoys music and he always scored the Bible. So you'd rather have that for him. Because Henry, inert, maybe depressed, unresponsive, and almost unalive. Henry? Yeah. Henry? Yes, so. I found your music. You want, you want your music now? Oh, yes, you Okay. Let's try your music, okay? Then you tell me if it's too loud or not. Then he is given an iPod containing the no his face of music. <laughs> And immediately, he, he lights up. His face assumes expression. His eyes open wide. He, uh, he starts to, um, to sing and to rock and to move his arms. And he's being animated by the music. And he's always sit on the unit with his head like this. He didn't really talk to much people. And then when I introduced the music to him, this is his, his reaction every time. <laughs> the philosopher's cat once called music the quickening art. 
and Henry is being quickened. He's being brought to life. Yeah. I'm going to take the music for one second, okay? Just to ask you a few questions. Okay? I'm going to give it back to you. Mm-hmm. Okay. The effect of this doesn't stop. Because when the, uh, the headphones are taken off, uh, Henry, normally mute, virtually unable to answer the simplest yes or no questions, is quite voluble. Henry? Yeah? Um... Do you like the iPod? Do you like the music you're hearing? Yes. Tell me about your music. I don't, I don't, don't, I don't have one of the music. Do you like music? Yeah, I'm crazy about music. You play beautiful music, beautiful sound, beautiful. Did you play music when you were, uh, were you, did you like music when you were young? Yes, yes, I did big dances and things. What was your favorite music when you were young? Well, I guess so. Uh, uh, Cab Calloway was my number one uh, guy I like. What's your favorite Cab Calloway song? Oh, I'll be on the book with Oh, you can come plant on me with plenty of snow near the toe. Present that brand new spring. Ow! So in some sense, Henry has restored to himself. He has uh, uh, remembered uh, who he is and uh, he's, he's reacquired his, his identity for a while through the power of music. What, what does music do, do to you? Yeah, so give me this feeling of love. Do, no less. Take a right hand. The world needs to come into music singing. you got beautiful music here. Beautiful. Oh, lovely. And uh, I feel the band of love. Strength. The Lord came to me and made me holy. I'm a holy man. So he gave me this time. So you say, I meet you. It's beautiful music. It's all that. You can have all the music which is significant for you in something that's bigger than Matchbox or, or whatever. And I think this, this, this may be very, very important in uh, helping to animate, organize, uh, and uh, bring a sense of identity back to people who are who are out of it. Otherwise, music will bring them back into it, into their own personhood, their own memories, their own autobiographies. So what I'm going to do is um, just go follow my own um, video or something. Here we go. I can't uh, slideshow. Okay. Okay, so I've actually switched my own copy of this here. Okay. Oops. Okay, great. Okay, so you can see it okay and you can hear me okay? Yeah. Okay, great. So, um, you know, that video is being used by nursing homes as part of new employee um, orientation training. It's even being used as part of the decision whether to hire someone. Um, uh, nursing um, administrators will show this to prospective new hire, and depending on how they respond, you know, if they respond kind of with heart or not, that will factor into whether they hire them. Um, so, you know, sort of like in terms of person-centered care and um, all of the key sort of uh, indicators of how we want people to be, it sort of uh, touches on that. So, um, who's your favorite singer? Um, you know, if, if you were to um, say to someone you know, um, if, you know, your favorite genre of music and, and, and think of a list of your top five favorite musicians or groups and, and ask, Someone you know, here's my favorite genre. I want you to name my top five great groups. Uh, would you, would they be able to figure that out? Um, you know, um, people don't know what did you listen to in high school very often, or college, or when you were young, or at different points in your life. They just don't know. Just the way we don't know for our residents, it's a mystery. And if people are non-communicative, uh, it makes the uh, the discovery process that much more difficult. 
Um, you know, do you remember the first live music you saw? I mean, you know, ask somebody that question. Or what's your favorite musician? Or what's your favorite song? Uh, even in dementia, you know, they're going to often remember that, you know, if they're, if they're still able to uh, um, articulate. It's those old memories, right? Was the first piece of music you purchased with your very own money? I mean, you know, you can think of many things. You can think of even when you, you leave work today and you get in the car, do you turn on the music? And so music is integral to sort of our sense of self and our being. We don't really think about it too much. We're all our own experts on music from the time as far back as we can remember. Um, and so it was difficult for me, roadblocks I would run into, is that people would go, okay, you know, music is nice. How nice are bringing the old people music? And I go, no, no, you don't get it. Uh, that I'm seeing something that's significant here. Uh, you know, drugs, mood-altering drugs, anxiety, depression, uh, you know, they don't generate this kind of response um, penalty-free. Right? So um, that's the point here. You know, we can replace lots of these drugs. People have replaced their antipsychotic meds. We have the state of Texas. Uh, they went from ranking number 51. Uh, last week they came out as number 23, which is uh, like the highest along with Arkansas in terms of improved uh, status among all of the states. Uh, and they attribute it to two things. They'll say uh, music and memory and their intensive uh, dementia training uh, for uh, staff, like 20,000 people have put through training. And so, and then music and memory is one sort of tool, one real world way to implement it. Um, and so that's, um, um, you know, sort of their perspective. And so, uh, this Brown University did a study in terms of reductions in antipsychotic meds. They looked at 98 homes, um, that ran music and memory versus the control group of 98 homes that did not. Um, and they found with statistical significance reductions in both antipsychotic meds usage and, uh, behavioral and psychological symptoms of dementia. Um, the, um, Okay, so, so do those closest you know your favorite music? The answer is most likely not. So if we're not going to know each other's music, how the heck are we going to know what someone loves? And so that's actually the hardest part of this whole thing is knowing what is what does someone love. Um, okay, I'm going to show you this next uh, video. It's three minutes. Uh, it's really from the perspective of um, uh, management. I can't think of any other program that has been able to be put in place that has impact on the whole facility, not just one department, not just one individual, that actually can cause that paradigm shift that every administrator loves to see. Music and memory program is giving us a competitive edge, and this is a competitive environment, and you have to stay above your competitors. Music and memory has helped with family satisfaction because when families come in, and they see their loved one in a mood state or more alert or able to converse. They just feel the whole program. They're buying into it when they see the results. We had such a good response from families. And what they said is that it really identified for them what music and memory was because it spurred their own reminiscing, their own emotional connections, and they were all sharing their own story. To actually witness the residents with the music and memory, you can see the joy on their faces. When you can make a resident happy and laugh, that affects the staff as well. They can share that moment with them. And that makes more bonding between the staff and the residents, which ultimately makes everybody happy. Staff begin to know their resident on a more personal level. And knowing the resident well, help you do things with psychotropic medications and improve the quality of life of the residents. It's by putting a little bit of music on, it just calms them, it soothes them, it makes them feel a lot more comfortable when the staff comes in to do rounds on them. You have a more peaceful, acceptable process that is humanizing and appreciated. If you are looking for a way to improve the quality of your building, music and memory is just such a beautiful way to do that. It's fun. You'll see the joy that it brings to your staff, your families, your residents. This particular program has value. It will give your staff the time they need. It will give you your quality, patient-centered care. It will give you successes 
It will reduce your antipsychotic rate. It will make you feel good and want to come to work tomorrow. Um, so I look forward to start thinking of your questions so for our Q&A at the end. Um, I know you can't, this um, slide is just chock full of text, but uh, basically it sort of sums up uh, outcomes generated, key videos, research, um, special initiatives. I'm just going to touch on some highlights here. Um, so uh, hospital readmission reduction. So the New York City Health and Hospitals, the largest public hospital system in the country, runs music in memory in all 11 of its acute care facilities, plus its 3,000 geriatric beds spread across five skilled facilities. So there's 16 facilities. Um, music in memory is used for delirium reduction. Uh, it's re used for uh, inpatient psych. It's used for rehab. Uh, it's used in detox. It's used in OBGYN. Um, it's used in emergency room. It's used all over. Um, and so, uh, and, and as people go between the nursing homes and the, uh, the hospitals, um, the, you know, the music goes with them, right, as they, as they go around. So people don't leave their nursing home environment and then they go to the emergency room and they sit there for, you know, a long time, perhaps. Um, and then they just, uh, get agitated and then they, you know, give them something to calm them down. And then, you know, it's an antipsychotic perhaps and then they come back to you that way. And so that's what they're trying to reduce in other ways. So you don't have those folks coming back. And so we also have the largest public hospital system in Australia that serves 1.6 million patients in 40 different departments. And so we see in the New York City, they recently had a, their own uh, all-day music and memory conference. The 80 people came from all these facilities, shared their own best practice, um, and they're fully into it. So all of you who are connected, no hospitals, you know, we want the, you know, your state, each of your state hospitals to just Talk to New York City, uh, you know, and what are they doing there, and why is it helping, um, and you know, what are the benefits, and you know, and how are they doing it, um, and 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 that way, because our goal is to have um, music really to transition along with people, um, and so uh, the delirium reduction piece um, is really uh, needed, right? When somebody goes to a hospital, it's a big, uh, you know, it's a common occurrence. Um, improve PTOT and speech outcomes, and people who you know, aren't communicating well. Um, that's one of the biggest pieces of feedback we have uh, from, um, and so we've trained 10,000 dementia care managers now. I've gone through the music and memory training uh, globally, uh, most in the U.S. and Canada, and um, so this is this is what they're finding: uh, fewer staff injuries, lower workers comp, um, so you know, um, less caregiver stress. So less stress for staff, um, less stress for people at home, uh, for those of you who are connected with home care, right? Um, so this is a uh, just a, and the different research studies uh, done in Toronto, the Alzheimer's Society there, and done one of the studies done, or five different studies done by five different teams in Wisconsin, uh, really found 50% reduction in caregiver stress for families at home. Um, and in Toronto, they use the same uh, um, tool uh, to track uh, the uh, reduction in stress, and they did the same. Also, in, in addition to caregiver stress reduction, there was increased caregiver confidence, whether that caregiver was a spouse or the caregiver was the CNA. Um, and so just an interesting statistic. We've also learned, actually, from Columbia Healthcare in Wisconsin, where they tried something with their residents who had difficulty swallowing. Um, well, what they learned is if you give people their music beforehand, um, that there's a really good chance that they're just going to uh, remember uh, somehow how to swallow again. Um, and so it, it was also so good. It's being published, actually, and uh, we work with a Dr. Stephen Post at Stony Brook uh, um, University Medical Center in New York, uh, who's sort of a global guy on end-of-life care for those with dementia and on ethical treatment um, and also taught me that in Canada they don't use feeding tubes, no pegs allowed, basically, um, and uh, so it's going to be in the publication, it's A-level publication called Dementia, uh, this summer um, about with this effort in Wisconsin. When Wisconsin found out about it, the Department of Health, they got everybody running music and memory on the phone. They brought Columbia Healthcare on the phone, said, you know, had them describe what they were doing, and the Department of Health said, go ahead, we don't need a 10-year NIH study to just give people music before they eat, right? We're already doing that. So they just give them their music before they eat um, or during, you know, or when they eat. Everybody's a little different. And we've always had this sort of um, feedback for people who 
are too anxious to feed themselves, too anxious to eat, or take them forever to eat. Um, and so music helps speed them up. It helps slow them down. It helps them feed them. So they pick up the utensil again and start feeding themselves. Um, and so they had a 72% increase in um, in uh, nutrition. Um, and so there was just, you know, just uh, increased appetite. Anyway, so, you know, you, you're starting to get a sense of, wow, there's just so many things. Like, where does this go? Where do you start? And so just the point is with so many people running this and trying it out, just there's all of your peers out there, thousands of them that are um, being creative in how they use it. I mean, if it's going to calm someone down and engage them, you know, well, where can you use that? You know, and so there's kind of no limit to trying. You know, if something doesn't work, you have nothing, you know, you have nothing to lose. Um, and we have a whole bunch of videos. Texas has produced four videos. A new video just came out of the state of Delaware. The Delaware Department of Health, a 21-minute video just documenting their rollout. Um, and so it's just um, – um, pretty uh, neat. Uh, the New York City Health and Hospitals that I referenced, actually they did produce the, uh, this, their research uh, for a 100-bed advanced dementia unit uh, was uh, captured in the um, Journal for International Neurorehabilitation or the International Journal for Neurorehabilitation. So that's available as well. Um, the uh, uh, there's a large study. Brown did that study I mentioned with the 98 homes. That was three or four years ago. Um, NAA, National Institute of Aging, liked it so much, uh, they went back to them to do a larger study. It's a three and a half million dollar study over five years. They finished year one to take a really close look at not just does this work, but how do we truly deeply integrate, um, personalized music into all, into, uh, uh, the world of skilled care so it sticks. Right? Despite the distractions, despite the turnover, despite um, the stresses. Um, and so that's, uh, you know, a big piece of that. There's another piece of research, a three-year project that was integrated into the 300 home, uh, California's 300 home rollout. Uh, UC Davis School of Nursing is running it. Uh, the leading uh, researcher nationally is doing it. And that's going to actually be out in August, they say. Um, and that looks at a whole bunch of things, including reduced hallucinations and just lots of good stuff. Um, the uh, a, a key to this is getting uh, youth involved um, and, and the community uh, to help uh, with that bandwidth and the time it takes to get find somebody's playlist, uh, student interns, nursing students. We work with the Lamar, the, um, uh, Lamar University School of Nursing in Texas. Uh, they did it. They loved it. They made a movie about it. They recommended it to their other 90 schools of nursing in Texas. Everybody needs to do this. The Texas Student Nursing Association adopted Music and Memory as its project, and now they're building it in, working with Madonna to build it into training uh, So um, and, and continuing education units. So this is a nursing uh, intervention, as I mentioned before. So, um, you know, and see as well. So the uh, I got to I was asked to keynote at the American Society of Consultant Pharmacists, so all of your oversight pharmacists, and there were a thousand of them there, and why did they ask a guy to talk about music? They said because they know that, that we are over-prescribing, right, these 10, 15 plus meds, and that that's not uh, sustainable, and it's not necessarily really positive. So they want to know that they have alternatives to recommend. And I said, well, I know that in the 20, and without being run out of town, if they say, nope, no answers, have you have given this person their music before, uh, you know, before you fill this prescription for an antidepressant um, or an antipsychotic, and they don't want to be run out, left out of town uh, when they make a recommendation for music. And my response was, well, I know in 25 states that have made music and memory public policy that, that you will be embraced, okay, and, and celebrated for doing that. Um, so that's sort of what's going on in the, on the pharmacist. So, and they're building it now. Um, pharmacy, want to build it into, you know, all of the pharmacist education and also the continuing education for the pharmacist. So, you know, that's going on. Um, IDD, uh, and so, uh, to our delight and surprise, this turns out to be usually helpful for folks um, who have intellectual and developmental disabilities. Uh, the first place to do this was actually in Wisconsin. Wisconsin was the first state to make this a state initiative, and then uh, the other 24 states followed. Um, others are in the queue, um, and uh, not everyone's in the queue, um, but we, we're, we're working to get there. Um, and in Texas, uh, they've rolled it out. They had such a great um, response uh, and outcomes for their IDD population. Uh, they they rolled it out for all 13, all state uh, IDD um, uh, nursing homes. 
Um, and it's not a matter of remembering music, but it is a matter of engagement and, and, and such. And there are um, sort of saying plans to keep people um, engaged and as positive as possible and communicating and just building it into their their care plan. Um, so they're very excited. They're talking about training all 13,000 of their employees, professional staff, period, uh, from the successes. Initially, and I just heard three more people in the last 30 days, never spoke a word, are now talking, uh, three different uh, sites within Texas. I mean, so, you know, and they're excited. So, um, and then the state did another film on it, and in addition to the film that was done sort of informally by the staff themselves. The time said, okay, so, um, a lot of stuff to go through, but let's see. Uh, so university, uh, so research. So there's a bit of research going on. Um, and the uh, most recent University of Utah did a brain imaging study for people uh, with the, who have their own, using their own music. And uh, the some head of some uh, bank uh, in Utah said, I want to fund really fine. What's really happening? And, you know, let's go beyond the brain imaging research of music and lighting up the brain. Let's find out more. And they did. Um, you know, really looked at the salience network, how, how music connects with our emotional system, and it showed the people with advanced dementia how it really lights up and, and facilitates connections in the brain and communi- intra-brain communication um, and just um, stuff that was really um, dormant uh, before. And what they did was they took somebody's favorite music, they pay, played 20-second block of it, and then they played a 20-second block of the same uh, piece of music, they played it backwards. And then they then they gave them uh, 20 seconds of silence. And the reason they played the music backwards is people would have said, well, those frequencies don't mean anything, right? So if you play backwards, they're getting the same frequencies, and it's only when they had the forward train, familiar music, the enjoyable part, that it had that um, resonance uh, in the brain. And, uh, and that this research is available. It came out in sort of Prevention of Alzheimer's. I don't remember the exact name magazine. A uh, bunch of other things. I'm not going to go through them. Um, Germany, the health system, they're doing a three-year study after a shorter study. They're ready to roll it out in their entire health system. Um, okay, this is um, from the uh, New York City, this uh, one home uh, where this is an earlier sort of research of their own. Number of falls went from um, in uh, one quarter from 11 to 3. Uh, number of residents involved in physical altercations went from 8 to 0. You know, you know how happy they are when fights stop. Um, and this is a tough population in New York City. These are people, many of them were homeless and, you know, that kind of thing. Um, but they also, you see that second to bottom line, percent of staff that are certified dementia care pr- uh, practitioners went from zero to 90%. So it's this blend. It's not just giving people music, but it's giving them with that, within the context of best care. Um, making caregiving easier and more rewarding, I mean, this is just, uh, you know, it, it, it raises, people tell me, the, the, the morale in, a, in their home has just overall increased, you know, sort of uh, improved um, from wherever it is. Uh, and the more it's done, the more it's fully embraced, the more the benefits. Um, uh, enhanced family interaction, we do know that people, we see people visit more, stay longer, have a better time when they visit because they have uh, a kind of a better mood for the, their family member. Um, and this is... Uh, there's a little quote on the bottom, music produces feelings that need no translation. Um, so, yes, this is a, um, there's a movie around this, Alive Inside. Um, it's available on iTunes and Amazon Prime and, and such, but uh, it won the m- most, um, 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 the audience award at Sundance. I mean, 50,000 people picked this out of the other 4,000 movies. So you definitely want to see it. It's not a maudlin, depressing, another Alzheimer's kind of movie. Um, you will, you will, um, People love it. Everybody does. Uh, it rates really high on Rotten Tomatoes, and IMDb, and all that. Um, so here's the map. All the facilities that run music and memory are on the map with their address. People can find them. Volunteers can find them only if you really want volunteers. Um, and this map, it's really U.S. and Canada blended together. But um, And then this map shows which states are the ones uh, in uh, that are brown uh, are um, state funded state supported Department of Health approved music and memory programs. Um, so Wisconsin, Ohio, uh, but but Michigan, not yet. Uh, my home state of New York, not yet. Um, and um, so that's that's just the scoop. We kind of go contiguously from California up to Wisconsin. Um, and the southeast is, is sort of uh, uh, they're sort of really trying CMS trying one state there, it's going really well, and then the rest will fall in. Uh, but that's the flow. I expect them all within 18 months or so to be running because everybody, nobody has, you know, it, it, it's working. Um, 
and it's, it's, it's kind of one of the easiest things you can do to get these kinds of results. So, you know, why can't doctors write a script, right? So you can make up a little script. Uh, they can check off, you know, um, you know, medication, you know, it's sort of music as, medic- as, as medicine. Uh, well, instead of, you know, antipsychotic, instead of depressant, uh, instead of hypnotic, you know, let's give them 150, you know, songs that are, that they, that have meaning for this individual. Uh, and it'll help, you know, deal with their refusal to bathe or their choking at meal times or, you know, increased anxiety or expressions of pain or inability to feed or insufficient intake. Um, so, you know, check off whatever daily music PRN. Uh, to eliminate or decrease uh, indications noted and improve outcomes 30 minutes to an hour for session, per session as tolerated, you know, signed off by the doc. Um, so um, this is what's coming. Um, so the medicine is the songs, the regimen is how often, the dosage is how long. Um, so you can play with that. So which are key here is we want people to come to you with their playlists already done. In Wisconsin, actually, the Medical Society, the Wisconsin Medical Society, recently um, made official uh, their recommendation that advanced directives include someone's playlist. So, and then that shortly, because they adopted it, it's, I'm told it's going to become just a national um uh, adopted nationally by all of their peer kind of medical associations. So, the, so after the three-year process, they get this approval, but but they did do it. Um, and the Dr. Dale Taylor, for those of you from Wisconsin, um, he sort of was behind it. Um, and so, you know, we want people to have their music um, in the playlist done when they're home and healthy. So when they enter the healthcare system at any point, whether they come to you or go to the hospital or whatever, um, they've got either the device or the list of songs. Um, sort of here it is, and that just saves you having to figure it out. It helps with um, eased um, 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 admission and transition, and such you know, less than that transition trauma. Um, and so all of these, you know, every emergency transport. I mean, why not use them in the uh, in the ambulances, um, chemo, uh, um, um, dialysis? I worked with folks in the dialysis unit, and that's like the worst. You know, people try to punch their way through it; they don't like it. Um, and so people like, you know, people with dementia, of course, trying to pull themselves, you know, off, you know, pull out uh, the, the, these uh, tubes that are stuck into them and stuff. Um, so you give them their music, they calm down. Um, so I have a lot of dialysis stories. Um, medical appointments, this is the Music of Memory website, you know, for information on how to get trained or what is involved, you know, it's right there. Uh, we have this free PDF for any family, how to create a personalized playlist for anyone at home. Um, and so, you know, it's a kind of let's do it moment. Um, anyway, so I'll uh, maybe stop there and open it for questions. Okay, thank you so much, Dan. It's valuable information that I think we can all use. Um, operator, can we open the lines for questions, please? Ladies and gentlemen, if you would like to ask a question, please press the number one key on your telephone keypad. Once again, if you have any questions, please press the number one key on your telephone keypad at this time. And we're waiting for callers to join the queue. Our first question comes from Matika. Please go ahead. Is this so, do anyone know where we can get, like, the iPad, iPods or MP3 players for cheap? So MP3 players are inexpensive kind of anywhere. Um, so what, what we've done is we standardized. At first, we were standardized on the iPods. They stopped making them. Uh, and so now we've standardized on uh, SanDisk, a particular SanDisk player, uh, because it works well with iTunes. And, and so we have Music and Memory has what we call our care community, and it's a special um, website with all of the hundreds of resource documents and aids and tools and marketing materials and discussion forums. And, and it also has, you know, where where – uh, the discounted prices that we get that everybody gets, you know, for the headphones and, and the MP3 players and the other pieces that are needed. Um, so if you just want to go out and buy one, you can just get one. The, the trick is in a facility, you don't want to have, you know, uh, you know, if you buy five MP3 players, you get five different brands or you, or you get donations in the five different types because uh, then staff will, will not use them if they don't, can't, if everyone has a different on-off button. So it's all about standardization usage for uh, rolling it out. Is that on your website, the link? So, the, well, that information, the, the discounted pricing is really not on the website. It's only in the case. 
community once people are certified. Um, the because um, it's only the uh, the pro- discounts are only available for folks that go through the music and memory certification process. Okay, thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, once again, if you have any questions, please press the number one key on your telephone keypad. Once again, if you have any questions, please press the number one key at this time. And we're waiting for callers to join the queue. And we have another question from Jennifer. Please go ahead. How do we become certified in the music memory? I'm already certified as a dementia practitioner, but how do I go about the music and memory? Super. Just uh, on the, go to Music and Memory's website. You can just type in Music and Memory. It'll get you there, musicandmemory.org. And right on the home page is a button, Get Trained, and it lists the process. Um, and as part of the process, one of the buttons is uh, preparing. We have a webinar that's preparing for um, certification, and that's for free. Anybody can go. It's a one hour, and it runs through sort of everything you need to prepare to do this, stuff you need to know upstream, like you need to get a laptop, you need to get um, uh, different people on the call. It shouldn't just be one person, right? This is part of a team effort. And so, and it runs through just uh, all of those questions. And so you can sign up there, and it's given like twice a month. Uh, and it also lists everything else. Um, it's sort of a, um, a page that shows everything involved, what the curriculum is, what's the breakdown of the training. Um, there's two days of training, two 90-minute sessions that are uh, online um, that I do live. Um, and then we have uh, online, we have a lot of recorded training. So we have videos on how to use MP3 players. We have videos on uh, and audios on care planning and um, on how do you get, really figure out how you work with a non-communicative um, resident. Um, so a lot of every month we have also a, a topic call um, where we dive into whatever topics people tell us. No, we need to hear more on X. Um, you know, um, and so we have all of those recorded. We have one thirty of those. Um, we have some music that's free to download. Not a lot, but some. Okay, how much is the cost for all that, you know? So the uh, certification cost, it's, it's one price for an unlimited number of staff. You could send 100 people, whatever, through it. And it's $1,250 if it's one standalone facility, if it's a chain or a group, um, then it's $800 each. And that's okay. for one year. One year, for, and so if somebody misses it, they can get training, they can go for free, no additional charge, any other month uh, during that year. And then year two, there's a $200 renewal fee, which gives sort of uh, access to continuous unlimited training for another year and continuous unlimited access to the care community. And all of this also includes um, being listed on the website for um, people to see. Okay, thank you. Our next question comes from Jackie. Please go ahead. Jackie, your line is open. Yes, actually, I'm in the room with Jackie, and my question is, do you have a hard copy booklet or kit that can serve as sort of an icebreaker uh, for uh, boards of directors or executive teams? Uh, and if so, how can I get one? So the best thing to do is show them the Henry video, right? Um, that that's, that is your start, and then and then the but, and then the uh, maybe the same two videos I showed you, the Henry video and and the leadership video. So that way, it's the management perspective. The Henry video is just sort of it, it's an emotional, you know, it's like this is what we this is what's possible. You have all this accident and such, or that they should see the Alive Inside movie. You know, at home or at work. I mean, I know people have, um, I know Governor Scott Walker had his whole state cabinet watch Alive Inside during the workday. Um, so nursing homes, you know, have done that as well. Uh, or, or people can watch it at home um, and then come in um, and talk about it. It's really the movie. It's really moved to catch, you know, there's so many things going on and so many programs and so many things coming at people. Um, it, it's really, it's the video uh, that, that counts more than anything. And then when they go to the website after that, then they can fill in on more stuff. But it's, it, to me, it's all about, it's, it, that's why we made it. We have a three-minute, this three-minute video you just saw. Uh, you know, you can always ask any anybody for if you have three minutes to look at this. Uh, we, we also have a 12-minute version, which uh, goes into just a, more um, by by these folks um, and others. Um, so that's what I'd say would be the best way to introduce 
this. Okay, and uh, the follow-up question would be, um, actually, do you recommend the next step after that? Because I did show, and it was very powerful and very well-received, the Alive Inside movie, and, and then it's sort of the ball's back in my court uh, as to, okay, uh, why don't you start something on your own, and I'm wanting to get more people to buy in and actually do something rather than just say, wow, what a powerful movie. So is there a next step that you would recommend if not a, a booklet to give to executive team people? I would say that preparing for certification would be good. Um, that would be helpful to attend that, maybe bring in uh, other people to that. Um, uh, you know, I think it's also a matter of, you know, what's the resistance, you know what I mean? So that it's really a redefinition. Other people have made this, you know, this is a, a, a uh, nursing intervention. It's not a program. Um, and it requires, you can say, you know, what we found, because what happens is, actually, you know, when I started, I was very happy to have director of activities go through the training. But guess what? You know, two years later, you know, many of them are gone, right? So it's turnover. And so, oh, and, and so therefore it dies. So we know that that's, you know, we have to have that full team in there. Uh, and, you know, and nurses are the ones that are uh, really in, you know, direct that's direct care with everybody. And so nurses, all job descriptions change. This is a big deal. Um, I would say have the, you know, administrators talk to others, you know, even in locally who are running the program. You know, how's it going? Was it worth it? Um, you know, this is the wave of the future. So this, is, this is now a standard best practice, right? So n nobody can say, I mean, I say this, I mean, if you, you know, people have to have their own music. That's best practice. There, there is nothing more. The states are telling us. I, I'm not making it up because, you know, I mean, Music Nerd is a nonprofit, and I started off not making any claims because, as I said before, I didn't really know much about a, a, anything related to.